Mm. Are you ready for a show? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ready to do the British Professor? Hello and welcome to the party site. Don't do that. Do you, do you not like the? Uh, no. You don't like the blind man? You know, it's the no, freaking. Uh, we interviewed a British guy. Does not mean you're British now? No, I'm British. No, you're not. I am from Scotland's yard. Scotland's yard. I am. On, that's where I'm <laughs> from. Born and raised in Scotland's yard. That's why I spent all of my days. Can we start the show then? Yeah. Welcome to the Boss Angle Podcast. Uh, stop. No. No. <laughs> I'm not going to stop this. No, we're not doing it. Why? Well, what's the problem? I'm British. I'm British. I'm going to walk away. Don't walk away. I'm British. You can't oh, walk Maurice. away. <laughs> you can't walk away. You're American. Walking away from a conflict. That's something you never hear from an American. I'm walking away. <laughs> I'm upset. He's making it all political. <laughs> Can we start now? No, no. Can we start? I mean, well, I'm, I've already started. Oh, you sound so muddled and I've all, weird. I don't know what your problem is. This is how you're it's, supposed to speak. We literally cannot start the show until you do your little, our little intro thing. Unbelievable. So we planned it. You know, you know, you know what your problem is. Is Looking that at our nice you know what what what, what your problem <sighs> is? Is that the American perspective is so parochial. It's so narrowly focused on your shores that you're unable to take in any further information from the rest of the world. Welcome, well, welcome to polypsych.org. There, one welcome to polypsych.org. <laughs> Welcome to the Polycyte Podcast. This is your host, Anthony Lindsay. And Stephanie Moreno. We interview Professor Dunbar at the University of Cambridge, uh, which is really cool. Uh, they, one, one quick thing I want to say is that when we interview these professors, especially ones that were from Cambridge or Oxford, one of the things that stuck out was their way of speaking extends to their email. <laughs> so just how you think that they would speak, like the way you think a British uh, professor would speak, especially... They speak that way, even in their emails. <laughs> so their like British sense of humor yeah, and their so strange like colloquial expressions, they extend to their emails. It was really cool. Anyway, um, we talked to Dunbar about his social circles theory, uh, specifically Dunbar's number, and uh, this is what he had to say. So our social world consists of a series of relationships of different quality, which are assigned a value. In effect, these consist of a set of rings of friendship that increase in number, but decrease in average emotional closeness. So the relationships in the innermost ring indicate those who are closest to you. So the fewer, the, the smaller the number, the closer the relationship. The larger the number, the less close the relationship. So I imagine, I imagine the, the inner circles are typically for like your parents or your Close friends, the people you see every siblings. day. Yeah, your siblings. Maybe. Mm. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. Unless you don't like your Could brother. Could be. It just yeah, it just depends on how close you are. Yeah, like it doesn't it. have to be. That's another cool thing is it doesn't have to be um, necessarily by blood family or anything. It could be someone that's just emotionally close to you. So these rings have very specific values: five, fifteen, fifty, one hundred and fifty, and five hundred. These rings are created by the way we distribute our social time and effort. We devote 40% of all our social effort to the five people in the inner ring, another 20% to the 10 extra people that make up the 15 ring, and the remaining 135 people share the remaining 40% of our time slash effort between them. So I imagine that like the people that are in your household, they'll get a chunk of your time, then the people... In your neighborhood, like your friends, they'll get another chunk of your time. And then those acquaintances that you don't typically see, they'll get the remaining percentage. Mm -hmm. Just the, the vestiges of whatever is left, yeah. is left over. And no, in the in the outer circles, no one person gets um, a special amount. It's it's just whatever they, uh, it's whatever you have time for in a given day. That person. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In other words, nobody's really special in the outer circles. It ah, just so happens that some sometimes one person will get a little bit more time that day, and sometimes none of them will get any time if there's none left over. They're just barely in that circle at all. Yeah. So uh, the rings correspond to very specific patterns of time investment, and if we fall below this with respect to one friend, that friend will slide down into the next layer. That's what you were saying, is that they'll just simply 
slide down the layer. And if they're on that outer ring, they could just be pushed off and all of a sudden you don't Entirely. speak to that person at all. Yeah. Right. So roughly we have to see each person in the five ring at least once a week. That's the minimum. And, um, you know, I think about the, uh, remember the fave five, your, your five oh, yeah. from the, that team mobile had going on. I loved that. Did yeah. you like that? Yeah, I never understood. I never knew what it was. Oh, I did at one point, but I don't know what it is. I now. loved it. It was like your favorite five yeah. people. They, they had them in little bubbles on your home screen. Yeah. And um, it would be like whoever you contact most. It's like a speed dial, but it goes a little bit deeper because you can just like you can text your fave five. You can include um, you can do like a group chat or group text or group call with your fave five and. There's a couple other features, That's really cool. but it, yeah, it sort it it encompass or it was um, centered around the idea that these are the five people that are the most important in your life that you will contact most frequently. So that's really cool. And so, like your mistress slips into your <laughs> your top five, and you have to explain. No, that you to your can wife. set it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, they they thought about that. I'm sure. <laughs> so every uh, everyone in the 15 ring is um you you contact at least once a month everyone in the 50 ring contact at least once every six month months and everyone in the 150 ring at least once a year so okay. they're your christmas card people that's really cool so they are assigned a value where the inner circle is given a specific value and then that value increases but your contact with that person decreases which is that's really cool he has the the social circles and it's a value attached to each one of those really mm -hmm. cool but that made me think of the mm -hmm. social media effect where you all have 700 800 fans on, friends on facebook five thousand followers on twitter mm -hmm. and like you'll have social celebrities so the people on instagram who have all of these followers mm -hmm. are they exempt from the social circles given that Hey, their outer ring might might have five thousand people in it who they can talk to at any given time. Uh, so we asked uh, Professor Dunbar about the effects of technology and what effect it has on his theory of social circles. And he said, "It seems that digital technology provides an alternative way to interact that we can use very effectively to keep up with friends that we would find it difficult to meet with in person. But it doesn't change the pattern of friendships." the rings or their sizes at all. It seems that on Facebook or wherever, we still have to speak directly to a friend for it to count. Simply posting a picture of our breakfast or a selfie that everyone reads doesn't count. He says that's just a form of voyeurism, which is good enough to make acquaintances, but not friendships. So celebrities aren't exempt from the effects of the social circles. Like mm. it's, this is all comprehensive. In other words, like I would imagine if you got 5 million followers, friends, whatever in the millions, you've got, you still have your five that are the people you talk to every day, whether they're on, whether you talk to them on social media or not. And then you've got the, and then you keep going out and out and out. And I would imagine that if you've got these millions of followers, then it just interchanges like every, every day, every so often, Somebody else gets put in that acquaintance spot and then someone else falls off completely. Wow. So that, that that's really cool that celebrities aren't exempt from this mm -hmm. and they're like they are stuck into this this system <laughs> of circles or whatever. Yeah. But like that effect of like going in and out of circles. I wonder if you have someone in your inner circle and they could just fall out as easy as you're saying that like someone hmm. who is a follower, a, an Instagram follower can slip into becoming in your inner circle if it can go the other way if you have a, a problem with someone in your inner circle can they fall all the way out and you don't <laughs> even contact them once a year anymore i think so i imagine so right yeah so i mean i'm sure we've all experienced that we've had a super close friend and then i don't know five years down the line you barely speak to him except for a christmas card anymore yeah huh oh. that, that also made me think of uh like celebrities not being exempt uh, one of the other misconceptions is that you'll be happier if you were a celebrity or happier if you did have more money. Uh, one of the studies that I was looking at uh, said that those who make over $70,000, mm -hmm. like your happiness, like if you, if you think of happiness, like on a graph, like most of that increase is from $0 to $70,000. And once you get over $70,000, your increase of happiness doesn't, it doesn't go up that much. Huh. Yeah, so it's wow. like all of that happiness is stuck in that first seventy thousand dollar range. Hmm. Yeah. So, huh? So, like a car salesman could potentially be just as a really good car salesman could be potentially just as happy as 
Donald Trump? Yeah, very much so. Wow. Maybe, maybe even more so because another study said that your social networks and the size of your social network mm-hmm. is more important than pretty much anything else when it comes to being happy. They were studying tribes and they had a large social network and they were living to be like a hundred and something years old. What? Yeah. Wow. If there are people that depend on you, you are more happy and you live longer because of it. it's almost like oh. I have to get up in the morning. I have to, my neighbor is expecting that pie that I always get. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> to, to bring it back to your analogy, if it's a car salesman and he has a lot of friends, yeah. like he may actually be happier than most of us. And especially since he's forced to be more outgoing, he's forced to interact with more people. And celebrities as well. They may actually be happier because they have to interact with so many other people. But if their social circle is smaller, then they may actually be less happy. So this, I'll be happier if I'm a celebrity thing. Maybe a complete myth. Hmm. So, uh, so Dunbar had that had a study in which he observed social grooming and monkeys and apes, which triggered the endorphin system in the brain and created a psychopharmacological platform off which the animals are able to build a cognitive relationship of trust, obligation, and reciprocity. So that made me think like, of the human application to that. And mm-hmm. essentially, if you're a monkey and you are picking the bugs out off of another monkey, your relationship uh, improves between the two monkeys. It's yeah. like a, a social There's, grooming. You have like trust. Like mm-hmm. apparently like um, the grooming is does require trust. Because you're just kind of relying on someone to help you out and get the parasites off of you. There is like an interesting little social factor in that. For humans, it's like that's how you, um, when you begin to trust, when you build those friendships that are based on like big factors like trust and not, m- not mutual them care. Picking, not them picking bugs out of your hair. Like is, is your maybe, relationship Maybe with not your- because with your, with, my, with your children, like when you when you have little small children – like you bond by giving them baths or by feeding them. You sit there and you don't, you're not you're not just completing a necessary task for that child. You're bonding with them. You play, you splash, you joke around with them and they they giggle and you get and you giggle and there's bonding that happens. So that makes me think of a, a study where uh, men were cuddling their wives. First of all, men like to cuddle more than women do. Did you know that? Huh. Yeah. So when you cuddle, uh, like after whatever, uh-huh. when you cuddle afterwards, it releases oxytocin, right. which is the quote unquote love hormone. So men were cuddling with their wives and it would increase the oxytocin, which evolutionarily speaking is a really, really good thing because if you're pregnant and if you have a baby, you don't want the male to like bash it against the wall. Mm. So oxytocin is very, very much necessary. It's also the reason that your child, your your baby looks like you for the male, looks like you, especially at birth. It looks huh. like the male because if it didn't, the male might not have as much oxytocin. He may so he relates not, to it a little bit. Yeah. So and they prevent him from like throwing it away. Like an immediate bond, mm-hmm. like a quick, like... We need something evolutionarily speaking that just gives an instant bond, yep. and then we'll work on the more intimate, tighter bonding later. But 100%. for for now, we just need something that just sticks them. Yep, one hundred percent. All right. Yeah, it was from that book, uh, "Sex at Dawn." It's a really good book. He also explained like other. Like, you get a uh, you get a things. lot of really important stuff about like human evolution development through that book. So yeah. I. Eventually, I'm going to read it, or I'm just going to let you summarize the entire thing over time for me. <laughs> All right, so back to this, uh, the endorphin system that Dunbar was talking about. Mm-hmm. So the endorphin system responds to any stressful effects on the body, but for, but for grooming and hence stroking, petting, cuddling in humans, there is a specialized neural system, the afferent C tactile nerves that run from the hairy skin directly into the brain. And the endorphin producing neurons that responds only to light, slow stroking. So it needs to be done just, it has to be light and slow yeah. in order to affect that. Yeah, apparently. Apparently like that specific Like, like it couldn't touch, be like a, like a noogie on the head? Nah, definitely not. Huh. I don't know. Huh, indeed. So this made me think of uh, the like tribal rituals that a lot of uh, indigenous tribes go through. Mm-hmm. And just the normal day-to-day things they have to do um, as a part of their culture and how it affects the relationship of the tribe itself. Um, 
Speaking of tribes, that made me, that that made me think of mm-hmm. like the multiple discovery theory, where different tribes in different places in the world will discover something like, around the same time for like no reason, and it happened a, a bunch of times in history. Uh, in the 17th century, uh, there were independent. Uh, scientists that discovered calculus, mm-hmm. like Isaac Newton and Gottfried William Leibniz, mm-hmm. so you say it. And Dang. then in the 18th century, the, there was a discovery of oxygen by uh, uh, Carl Schill and Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier? Mm-hmm. Lavoisier? Lavoisier, I think. Yeah. So, and then the theory of evolution uh, that came from both Darwin and Wallace. At the same time. So like, it's weird that like these different discoveries were discovered by different scientists in different parts of the world independently. And the same thing happens now. As a matter of fact, it happens now even faster because of the, the transmission of information between people. So it used to be that like if you were a tribe, you might develop the crossbow. As a matter of fact, the crossbow was one of them. Oh, yeah? The crossbow was invented independently in China, Greece, Africa, a couple places in Africa, uh, northern Canada. And the Baltic countries all at the same time, mm. around the same time, independently. And look at the crossbow. Like, it doesn't, how? How did that happen? But yeah, they only, no. I've seen, I've seen different examples of them and they only vary slightly, but not in like the basic tenets of it. Yep. Huh. Yeah. Fascinating. So, yeah. But what were you saying about the modern? Like how it still happens? Yeah. Even scientists, more so with the increase. Yeah. It's just a theory of, uh, of multiple discovery. Also called it a simultaneous invention. Where if you're a, if you're a scientist in MIT, you may come up with a theory or find something. Yeah. Same thing with social scientists; they may find a political discovery, and at the same time, across the world in Russia, hmm. there will be another scientist that finds the exact same thing, and you both publish it, and it you have yeah. they have to try to figure out who copied who. When, that theory and might actually, you both discover it independently. Yeah, that theory might like produce some skewed results in this day and age, though, because you're saying that. Like information is so readily available across yeah. spans. Like, yeah, like people. I mean, it wouldn't be, really be as big of an anomaly for two people on opposite sides of the world to come up with the same invention, given how much information is, is able to be spread. But like, I find it really crazy that someone in South America and someone in, you know, early Western Europe <laughs> invented what calculus or something like that. Yeah, calculus. Like, Mm-hmm. At the same time, in in an age where, you know, they might as well have not known that each other existed, even close. Yeah, it was. It's more impressive back in the 16th yeah. century for sure. <laughs> like before, it, it makes people. you go oh, magic. Yeah, like how? Wizardry. Like you didn't have the internet. <laughs> What'd you do? So, but now it's like, yeah, they could easily have looked it up. Uh-huh. And but you also have to think of parallel thinking, where if you both are given the same amount of tools, you might both come up with the same things. If I gave you two tires. Uh, a bar i gave you a handlebar in a seat and then i gave that to two different scientists in two different rooms mm-hmm. you might both come up with a bicycle yeah especially if um if both have experienced the need like the social need the personal need um like imagine if you're like hmm i could both people are thinking of like what what could we do to get from the village to the coast like a little faster yeah and then all of a sudden, someone gives them a wheel, a seat, and handlebars. Like Bike. They both need it. Yeah, they both are thinking of what can we do to make this ba- better. And then it just forms a bike, even if they'd never seen a bicycle before. You know what's more impressive? When someone comes up with something, like, crazier. Anytime someone comes up with any kind of invention, I, I cool, go crazy. Because personally, like, <laughs> that's not how my brain works. <laughs> I don't, like, see... A paper clip, a screwdriver, and a credit card, and see like hot air balloon or something. Like that's just not how I work. It needs to be a little bit more straightforward. <laughs> or give me instructions. <laughs> I'll build the hot air balloon with instructions. I'll do it. All right, the show is over. Uh, we would like for you to do one thing for us. Uh, tell two friends to download the Polyslight like podcast. Shoot them an email, a text, a raven. Anything. Just tell just tell two friends to download the Polycyte Podcast. 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 <laughs> tell two friends to download this Polycyte Podcast. How many friends? No, like four or five. <laughs> I'm going to tell them all. <laughs> Thanks, it. everyone.